Thanks, um, Art and Brian, for those kind words. I guess I'll start the meeting. So I mentioned that tonight is a dual meeting. And what's going on is that it's our regular monthly meeting for Western Colorado Astronomy Club. I'm also a member of BCAS, and I'm also a member of the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society back in New York, my friends back in New York. And Joel Seif, whose name is up on the screen, is the president there. And um, Joel, if you want, why don't you put your picture up? So Joel has had internet problems and his June speaker is, a, is even firmer than me about, I don't wanna do it unless it's a live presentation. So that got postponed. So what Joel suggested was to um, take the, the June meeting for MVAS and lump it into the one for tonight in particular because our speaker tonight is a member of MVAS. So it seemed like the very nice, cozy, friendly thing to do to join the two club meetings together. So Joel might have a, a word or two to say before we start the meeting and then I'll, I'll um, describe our program and turn it on to Gordon. So we have folks from Michigan and we have folks from back in New York and our two clubs here in Western, on the Western Slope. So. We have a nice crowd of people tonight that we can interact with. So Joel, if you wanna say anything before I start the meeting, Joel is the president of MVAS. So you might wanna say a word or two. You have to unmute. Thank you, Nancy, for an, uh, announcing uh, the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society and, and welcome MVASers and um, I just wanted to say, uh, I was going to contact Gordon to see if he could be my fill-in speaker. And as soon as I was about to do that, I received the invitation from Nancy that Gordon was presenting tonight. So I said, okay, that makes my job e easy. So uh, thank you, Nancy, and uh, welcome everybody. Okay. That's it for me. Okay, so um, if um, I'll introduce Gordon and tell you about the program, and then I'll let Gordon decide whether he wants to take questions during the presentation. Um, if people want to unmute, I'll let him decide, but I'll tell you a little bit about our program and our speaker tonight. So the speaker is Gordon Fessinger, and he is, again, a member of the Mohawk Valley Astronomical Society. And his program title is The Development Operation and accomplishments of the Hubble Space Telescope. So the talk provides a short history of the vision and the hard work that led to the approval of the program, an overview of the design characteristics of the observatory. It includes a quick overview of how Hubble is scheduled, pointed, and how the resulting data processed and a slightly more detailed look at its maintenance and upgrade over the years. The talk concludes with a summary of the program's major accomplishments. So a little bit about Gordon, our speaker. Um, again, he's a member of MVAS, which is in central New York State. After a 23 year career as a meteorologist in the US Air Force, he worked another 13 years as a system engineer on the program to field the latest generation of polar orbiting weather satellites. His childhood interest in astronomy was thwarted by the dreaded department store refractor, but he rekindled it in 2017 when he and his wife traveled to Jefferson City, Missouri to view the total eclipse. So I must say that I'm very happy that Gordon came back into the fold of amateur astronomers, and I will allow him to start sharing um, his, his screen, his slides and his sound. And Gordon, once you do that, um, you can let people know if they can interrupt with, well, I shouldn't say interrupt, I don't like that term. If they can ask questions during your presentation or if you'd like them to hold it till the end. So Gordon, go ahead and share. Thank you, Nancy. Um, again, appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to do this presentation, uh, something I've always kind of enjoyed. Hubble is something that uh, I have been interested in since it since it launched, I've had a long time interest in space exploration in general, 
uh, both manned and unmanned. And, and Hubble, you know, in my mind, is kind of the, the perfect blend of both uh, robotic exploration uh, through a remotely operated observatory and manned space program that uh, fixed the thing and, and has kept it up and running for 30 years. Uh, as far as questions go, um, it's probably a, a little bit easier um, if we wait until the end, um, just because it's hard to, to see an audience. I, obviously now I can't see anything but my screen. Um, I'm one of those people that would all, also very much prefer to pre present in person, but that being said, um, I'll jump into it here. If you do have a question and it just can't wait, go ahead and I'll, I'll field it the best I can. So to get started, just a little bit of uh, disclaimers and things. Uh, I don't have any personal experience with the Hubble. As, as you heard during my introduction, I do have some um, space experience, but that's with uh, weather satellites. Uh, the information for this presentation I pulled primarily from the mission websites, the NASA website, um, the Space Telescope Science Institute uh, website and the ESA website. And then there were some additional sources that also provided a lot of good information, uh, particularly a couple of books. This handprints on Hubble that is listed by Catherine Sullivan. She's uh, one of the astronauts that uh, had a, played a significant role in both the development of, of Hubble over the years. That's a very readable uh, book and it, it's, it's quite interesting. Then the uh, the second book down there by David Shiler, also quite in depth, although I didn't particularly care for the way that was structured. And then um, there's a rabbit hole called the NASA Technical Reports uh, server, and you can you can go down that rabbit hole and, and end up in places that you'd never imagine. Uh, all kinds of technical reports from NASA are archived on that. And uh, so I pulled some Hubble information from them. Of course, Wikipedia, um, web searches for some other things, and a couple of articles in astronomy and, and um, sky and telescope. Everything, all the images and things are either public domain or I hopefully have attributed properly um, to the author. So let's get started. And I, you know, the, the idea of a space telescope is something that's been around for quite a long time. 1923, Herman Oberth, uh, in his book, The Rocket into Planetary Space, uh, mentioned that, hey, you know, this, uh, a rocket could launch a, a telescope into space. You know, this is long before there was even really much in the way of liquid fuel rocketry. In 46, uh, Lyman Spitzer published a paper um, that really talked about all the advantages that uh, there would be if you could put a, a large telescope into orbit. The, adva the advantages of uh, angular resolution only being limited by diffraction, nothing, not, not the atmosphere, um, plus the ability to have better IR and UV observations, again, because you know, the, the photons aren't passing tr through, the, uh, through the atmosphere. Then in 62, the National Academy of Sciences recommended that NASA do um, develop a space telescope. And in 65, then Spitzer was again named and, and he headed up committees to define what those the specific scientific objectives of a space telescope would be. Early on, um, a couple of studies in 1962, they identified a lot of uh, challenges. You know, how are you going to track um, and point um, or point a telescope and track that target from something that's at orbital velocity. How are you going to return all this data? You're going to you're going to develop huge amounts of data. How do you get it back? Do you transmit it? Do you do you return film? Remember, this is early '60s, um, and there was even question as to whether or not a conventional mirror would um, last long in the environment of space, but. 60s were a time of really rapid development. Both the civilian and military space programs drove an awful lot of rapid uh, development in the aerospace industry and uh, provided solutions for a lot of these things. The early 60s, uh, both industry concepts and the things that NASA was studying, they focused on man-tended designs. So, you know, you take a look at the picture here on the left, what you've got is a, a notional space telescope that's being launched on a Saturn V, this S2, that's the second stage of a Saturn V. So you've got a rather huge 
space telescope here and you can see you're, you're docking a, an Apollo to it and then you know and this idea is that you've got people living in a shirt sleeve environment that are actually uh, tending and, and working in that observatory. By the end of the 60s, later into the 60s, uh, as technology advanced and we gained experience in space, the, does, the idea kind of changed to uh, more of a man uh, maintainable, not man tended. Um, so you see, in, again, in these uh, drawings here, you've got a, a suited astronaut who's performing maintenance and same thing with this artist concept. So you've gone from something that, that uh, needed a man in a shirt sleeve environment to operate the instruments and, and maintain the scope to something that's remotely operated, but manned, um, maintained by astronauts. So in 1968, this ended up being the start of an official program called the Large Telescope, Large Space Telescope. And it was going to be launched in 1979. And the plans really emphasized the need again for this manned maintenance, on orbit maintenance, to ensure that there would be a long life for the mission. And you notice that it was uh, quite a large, initially they were talking about a three meter mirror on, uh, on the large space telescope. During, um, during the late well, 60s and into the 70s, there were some precursor um, observatories that, that were launched. The orbiting solar observatory, five of the eight launched uh, were successful. And there's a list there of some of the significant scientific achievements that that, that had. But you'll notice that's all X-ray and gamma ray uh, observations that, that that's doing. Um, there was the orbiting astro astronomical observatory. Uh, two of four of those were successful. But again, now there's not an awful lot of optical going on here. That's all UV and uh, some X-ray. Skylab was... Uh, a very significant um, observing mission. They had the, the uh, Apollo telescope mount. So this area right here, there were nine instruments, or excuse me, eight instruments on this area that were uh, dedicated primarily to uh, studying the sun. So you can see the list of instruments there. And this tended, this was back kind of to the, the old idea where um, it was man tended. It couldn't be operated. Those instruments couldn't be operated from the ground. The crews on board uh, actually operated the instruments and had to go out on EVA here um, to change out film um, containers and, and, uh, and load more, more film cassettes. Well, in the 70s, it turned into a fight for funding, even though there was a program that was started in, in 1968. Uh, in 1974, all funding was deleted for the Large Space Telescope. And um, that led to a, a, an outcry by um, a lot of the astronomers around the country and around the world, and was really championed by Nancy Roman, who was the NASA Chief of Astronomy. She organized a lot of behind the scenes efforts uh, to raise money and, and lobby congressmen and uh, get the National Academy of Sciences to, to publish a report. Um, and you see the, the, the caption in that picture, you know, the mother of Hubble. She's kind of, she's kind of uh, considered the mother of Hubble for all the hard work that she did. And it led to then Congress in 1978 once again, approving funding for the Space Telescope. And in honor to honor her and the work that she did in the time that uh, she was the NASA Chief of Astronomy, uh, in May 2020, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope was renamed the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So anyhow, 1978, program's back on track, but there's one problem. They cut the, the funding in about half, and so they've got now thirty-six million dollars that they can they can start to use to design and, and produce this uh, the space telescope. Those cutbacks brought some changes to the program. First of all, the mirror size was reduced down to two point four meters. Originally, there was supposed to be what was called a pathfinder 
uh, space telescope. It was a smaller 1.5 meter uh, space telescope, and it was supposed to prove out some of the technologies and ideas uh, and concepts that would then be implemented on the, on the larger mission. That was cut out. And it brought on board the European Space Agency uh, with them providing some things and being guaranteed at least 15% of the observing time once the telescope was on orbit. Anybody who's read anything or had any experience with NASA will know <laughs> that there's a lot of different centers and the centers, they're like a, it's, it's like a family fighting for pieces of a pie at, at Thanksgiving after, after dinner, you know, they all want their piece of the pie. So the way it shook out in Hubble was that Marshall down in Alabama, they ended up being responsible for the overall development and integration of the hardware and that they were also going to um, manage the on-orbit verification of the systems of the telescope. Can it point, uh, can it transmit data? Does it, you know, are you able to upload, download, et cetera. Goddard in, in Maryland, they were responsible to define the uh, scientific requirements for the scope and the, for the telescope and the instruments, then manage the actual observing operations of the, of the telescope once it was on orbit. And they were also responsible for uh, doing the verification phase on the instruments to, to uh, it's called cal calibration validation to, to dial in the instruments and, and verify that they're working. And as it says there, you know, kind of develop the safe operating procedures. ESA uh, was to supply the faint object camera. They also provided the uh, solar panels and some funding and staff to help. And then the Space Telescope Science Institute in Maryland, they schedule the, uh, the scope and they deliver uh, the data products. They make the data products available to the principal investigators and other astronomers. So a lot of things that went into the preliminary design of the scope, they had to think about. You know, thermal control was was a very big thing. You know, we think about thermal control when when we go out on on a night, particularly up here in upstate New York, and I imagine the same in Colorado. If it's a late fall or a winter night, you you, you take your scope outside. Well, you got to let it equalize to get rid of some convection currents in the OTA and things, so that you can get good observations. In Hubble, they weren't really concerned about that. No air, no convection currents but they were concerned with how the rapid swings in temperature going from shadow to sunlight twice, you know, once every 45 minutes, the sunrise sunset in a 90 minute orbit, how that would affect the structure. And this later out, it turns out, and we'll, we'll talk about this in a bit, that there were, there were some concerns that uh, they didn't catch. They wanted to, you know, I had to figure out what wavelengths to observe, how to do it, uh, again, how to point and maintain that stability. And here's where uh, the technology over the intervening years really helped in, in weather satellites and, and spy satellites. Really, you know, that, that technology was di directly applicable. The launch vehicle was also something that, that uh, was uh, they, something they had to consider. The original plans were that it would be able to be launched on multiple launch vehicles. There, it, there wouldn't be tied to a single one to allow flexibility. Later, they, they tied it to the shuttle. And again, that did have some implications down the road. And then a lot of work defining what was meant by maintainability and how did you perform that work? And something that I've, I found interesting and I had never known until I started reading some, some of this and researching this was that originally the thought was it would only be minor um, maintenance on orbit. And every few years or so, the shuttle would go up and bring this thing back down to the ground for overhaul. And uh, the more they thought about that, the more they realized that that was just going to be a, a lot of problems. And the shuttle was not turning out to be anywhere near as economical as was originally thought. So that caused a lot of uh, rework and uh, design changes. So it was a 15 year mission life. And that's always just kind of a notional thing. You, you know, you think about it, but the, that 15 year mission life just meant that uh, 
everything was designed and, and was supposed to return all the science and meet all its objectives within 15 years. And you know, NASA always over engineers anything. You take a look at, uh, you take a, let me say, opportunity. You know, opportunity rover on Mars, nine month or excuse me, three month mission life. And uh, 14 years later, it finally died. So the design of the telescope itself was a Richie Kretien uh, Cassegrain. And we'll go back to our, our, uh, our high school conic sections. And so this design has the hyperbolic mirrors, which give a better field of view with fewer optical errors. So, uh, you know, if you, if you come over to the conic sections, you, you just, if you had a plane that bisected those cones perpendicular to them, there's your hyperbola. Whereas, you know, on uh, like my Cassegrain has a parabolic mirror and that the plane that intersects is at an angle. Incredible pointing accuracy, seven thousandths of an arc second pointing accuracy. And then uh, the angular resolution of a of four hundredths of an arc second. That's, you know, pretty good. Although nowadays with uh, adaptive optics, et cetera, um, ground-based, large ground-based telescopes are starting to approach that same kind of angular resolution. Only thing of interest really in, in dimensions is the fact that it gained 3000 pounds over the years over as the maintenance missions. And it was designed primarily as an optical instrument for visible light. It did, it does, um, observe a little bit into ultraviolet as well as a little bit into the infrared. And here was the initial set of suite of instruments. So we take a look, this is what the thing looks like. You got an aperture door, that's pretty much just the lens cap. Your OTA is in here um, and the high gain antennas to transmit the data, receive commands, solar cells to transmit power. Reaction, this area here had a lot of the instruments, uh, the computers, the reaction wheels, things of that nature, the, the systems. And then the aft shroud in here was held, are, is held, um, the, the instruments for the most part. Closer look at the OTA, this looked familiar to anybody, you know, with a, a Cassegrain design. Lights coming in, bounces off the primary mirror, up to the secondary mirror, through the baffle into the... Uh, little aperture in the primary mirror down there and here's the focal plane. And then the four primary instruments along the axial part of the aft shroud there. And then what you don't see, it isn't shown here, there's three of these fine guidance sensors and down below in, one, in the fourth slot was the wide field, or is the wide field planetary camera. So the fifth, fifth instrument in Hubble. Take a look at the orbit, um, had an average height of uh, 340 miles. Here you can see it's inclined at 28 degrees, 28 and a half degrees. So that's an idea of what the orbital track would be on one orbit. This little gif here, what that's showing you is if the earth is this dot in the center and it, you assume it's not rotating, it just shows the precession of the orbit as the earth rotates underneath the ground track. So it, it each successive ground track is a little bit further west. And that changes how Hubble can see things in space. What's visible to it, what's not. So actually getting to observe with the, with the Hubble. Some things he had to take into account. Um, this little thing I drew over here, not really to scale, but we've got the sun in the center. Here's the orbit of the earth. Here's the Earth, orbit of Hubble around it. So you've got a solar avoidance angle, about 50 degrees. I drew it at 45 degrees, either side of the sun. But roughly anything inside of here, Hubble can observe, excuse me, won't observe, so that sunlight doesn't intrude into the OTA um, for the Earth and the moon. Uh, to keep bright light out. And there's another place where you can't take observations and that's the South Atlantic anomaly. And the South Atlantic anomaly is an area where our magnetic field is the weakest in this area. 
and that allows the radiation of Van Allen radiation belts to come closer uh, to the earth, to the surface. And this causes quite a few problems as satellites orbit through there. So anytime Hubble is going through the South Atlantic anomaly, it's not observing due to, due to all the radiation hits. A lot of words here, um, but how, do, how does it schedule? Anybody, anybody can apply for time. No restrictions on the nationality or, the, or affiliation. Uh, the only thing is that you have to be a US uh, institution to get funding from our government. Intense competition. About a fifth of the proposals each year are, are uh, accepted. Every year, roughly, they, they have a call for proposals. And there's a couple of different types. General observer is the most common. Um, those are the things like maybe somebody's uh, wanting to observe um, galactic centers, whatever. Things, things that are long, long term um, can be viewed at any time and uh, require a fair bit of observing time. Snapshot observations are things that are, can be done in 45 minutes or less. And uh, these are used to fill these little gaps in, in uh, the, the schedule. Targets of opportunity, um, they're for transient events, but transient events that can be predicted. In other words, you know, you know perhaps a comet is making a close approach to the sun and you wanna study what's off-gassing or something of that nature. So that's, that's a, a transient uh, opportunity, that, but it, it's known. And then up to 10% of the time is discretionary time for unexpected transients, a supernova, a gamma, a gamma ray burst is detected and, and they want to uh, point to see if they can catch any, any uh, light coming, other light coming from it. So people submit this phase one proposal that you're just telling them what you want to observe. Why do you, you know, why is it worth observing? What are the targets and where are they? What instruments and how are they configured? And about how much time is it going to take? And then this committee takes a look at them all and makes the cut. Phase two, again, a lot of words, I won't go into it much, but what phase two does is it takes that proposal and actually turns it into, com into computer code, the, the, uh, the command lines that would have to go up to Hubble um, to make the observing program happen. And it's not acceptable until it's gone through a pretty rigorous uh, review process. Then it goes into the scheduling windows. So the scope, the Hubble is scheduled on a week long basis. And you pool the, this scheduling group, and this is a job I would not want. They're, they're going from a pool of uh, approved programs and building the calendar and, and building the times and, and where everything where Hubble is actually going to look. And then the loads that were built up here by the, by the investigators are then built into the command loads that actually get uploaded to Hubble to carry these things out. And that happens about five days before. That's a lot of work. And I can't imagine you think about, uh, you know, you, you got a you got a telescope that's traveling seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Uh, your target sometimes going to be occluded by the Earth. Maybe you know when can you see it? How long do you see it? it, it it's just an awful lot of things that they have a, a pretty intense jigsaw puzzle to put together. So here's a little video that uh, goes goes through how Hubble is actually pointed. So now we've we've built the schedules. We've uploaded the, the weeks commands. And how does Hubble actually point and hold these targets? Since its launch in 1990, the NASA ESA Hubble Space Telescope has been exploring the universe. To obtain crystal clear images of distant galaxies and faint nebulae, Hubble relies on sophisticated hardware to keep its gaze locked onto its target. From its vantage point above Earth's atmosphere, Hubble observes the universe 
whirling around Earth at 28,000 kilometers an hour, Hubble has to rely on its finely tuned pointing control system to make sure its scientific instruments are looking directly at its remote targets. To ensure its gaze never falters, Hubble uses three fine guidance sensors located around the circumference of the telescope. These sensors provide precise pointing information for Hubble. They look out for auxiliary guide stars, which enable Hubble to determine its orientation in space and to stay focused on one point. When the telescope drifts by even a minuscule amount, these sensors will detect it. To change its orientation and to correct for drifts, Hubble does not use propellants. Their fumes could contaminate Hubble's observations and limit its lifetime. Instead, reaction wheels steer the telescope using the elegant principle of Newton's third law. If one of the wheels turns clockwise, Hubble will turn counterclockwise. These four massive flywheels spin rapidly under the control of Hubble's computer and move their telescope using the immense torque generated by their spinning. But even at its fastest, Hubble only rotates as quickly as the minute hand of a clock, just 90 degrees in 15 minutes. Detecting such minute movements requires the best and most sensitive gyroscopes in the world. Hubble has six of them. They constantly measure if and at what speed the telescope is turning. In combination with the fine guidance sensors, they keep the telescope precisely pointed for long periods, enabling Hubble to produce its spectacular views of the universe. To operate with optimal efficiency, Hubble needs three of its six gyroscopes. But even if just one was available, its scientific capabilities would not be affected in the slightest. Together, these three systems have allowed Hubble to perform its outstanding scientific mission over the last 28 years and many more new discoveries can be expected in the years to come. Okay, so Hubble has observed a target. Photons have come in, been recorded. They then get transmitted over to the TDRS, the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite, downlinked into White Sands, the ground station at White Sands, Commercial comms get it to Goddard in Maryland. And from there, it's sent over to the Space Telescope Science Institute. They archive it and make it available to the astronomers whose program it was supporting or eventually to the general public as well. And it gets turned then into final data. As I just mentioned, the, the, this group in, uh, in Baltimore, they archive all of the data. And it's in this uh, Mikulski archive for space telescopes. Everything that you would need to, to process the data is archived. The science data, the calibration data, the engineering data, all of it's right there. Um, there's a lot of documentation on their website that tells you how, how and software tools. It's important to note, really, that only some of the data that are captured by Hubble is widely distributed, okay? The general public can go in there once, once the science, the, the people who, uh, whose investigation that data was supporting, once they're through, general public can go in and process that data themselves, much like what you can do from the Juno mission to Jupiter. Um, and there's an awful lot of ways to do that. You know, if you were to search the web for processing Hubble data, you'd find all kinds of tutorials and assistance and where you could process your own Im images from that Hubble data. So let's get the thing on orbit. First of all, 
the the uh, change to relying on the shuttle forced a slip because of the Challenger disaster. About three and a half years. It was originally supposed to go up in 86 and it finally launched in 90. And that delay did some good things to the program and had some negative effects as well. One of the things was it allowed a lot of refinement to the plans, the servicing plans, and a lot of rework to make it more maintainable on orbit. It allowed time to complete the ground software and also swap out batteries. Anybody, one of the things I found, NASA loves the space side of it and the ground side of it is always behind. It was the same thing on, on my program that the, 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 uh, the ground software to con command and control and process the data was behind. Let's get the thing up there, get the data, we'll get it down and we'll work on it later. Negative side of things is that uh, all this time, that three and a half hour or three and a half year delay, Hubble had to be kept in the clean room, had to be powered up, purged, and that cost about six million dollars a month. Another interesting thing was that it moved the launch closer to a solar max. A solar maximum, the increased um, activity on the sun, it makes the Earth's atmosphere expand some, which increases atmospheric drag, even at orbital altitudes that it was. And that drove a lot of detailed trade studies about just how high um, the Hubble was going to be released. There was a, a, a lot of trade offs because, you know, the scientists wanted it as high as it could get. And the, the astronauts wanted to make sure that they had margin to, to be able to get down. And, and the highest shuttle flights were those to, to Hubble. So right at, the, right at the edge of its capability. So in April 90, it got launched and, and released into space. And uh, while it was, when it was released, while that was happening, Bruce McCandless and Catherine Sullivan, they were suited up and waiting to go outside if they had to, to help unfurl solar arrays because once the umbilical was disconnected, there was only so much time the batteries would last. And there was, they had a lot of contingencies that uh, fortunately they didn't have to uh, use. They were always disappointed. It's funny in her book, she, you know, she says how disappointed she was that she stuck in the airlock while all her crew was <laughs> plastered to the window watching the thing be launched or be released into space and she didn't get to see it. But we've all, we've all know this story. As soon as it was launched, got first light, it came about that uh, the mirror was flawed. And you know, that was in newspapers and magazines. It was the brunt of late night comics jokes all the time. Everybody had a lot of fun at Hubble's expense because of the flawed mirror. Well, what actually happened? How, would, how was the mirror flawed? There was a, a, a device that was used to measure the grinding. And that measurement tool was actually improperly assembled. And that led to the spherical ab aberration. The edges, the outside edges, you know, they, they were ground a little bit too flat. One eleven thousandths of an inch too flat. And that caused a spherical aberration. And the biggest effect that had on, on observations was uh, on faint objects. Um, there was an interesting article, a uh, little blurb in, uh, I, I can't remember if it was astronomy or sky and telescope, uh, where somebody was saying how, you know, the CoStar didn't save Hubble. There, there was plenty of good data that came down to it without, without being having the aberration fixed. Well, I mean, that may be up to, up to debate, but uh, he had a point. Servicing missions. Okay, so back in 79, they had started the servicing missions. They, they, they trained on test articles in, in pressure suits, out of pressure suits, in, in vacuum chambers, underwater, on the actual hardware sometimes. And that was mainly Story Musgrave, Bruce McCandless, and Catherine Sullivan. And they, they did a lot of work in developing the tools and uh, feedback. And there was even early um, virtual reality. Uh, here you see they're doing some, doing some work with virtual reality, learning and, and practicing the maintenance. 
one beauty about the servicing missions and one one thing that was okay i mean you know yeah the mirror was flawed but it, it was flawed precisely it, it was it was a perfect flaw and because of that it could be fixed relatively um easily by corrective optics uh interesting story i found again the engineer in me loves loves the kind of stories like this this is this is the actual coast out here these are the mirrors that uh, corrected the light and was re redirecting it into the instruments on the axial instruments here. And the engineer that, that came up with this idea, he got this idea for how these mirrors would pop out by um, a shower in, in, in Europe, you know, a shower that, where the head went up and down and, and folded in and out. And he, he looked at that and, and it's like the light bulb went off and, you know, he came up with the with the design for how how they were going to get the co-star mirrors in. So now we get into the servicing missions. The first one, obviously, the big thing to do was to fix the corrective to fix that uh, aberration. So they took out the wide field planetary camera and the uh, high speed pho photometer, and in its place went co-star that replaced the high speed photometer and the wide field planetary camera too. Interesting thing there is, is that Co CoStar didn't do anything to help the wide field planetary camera. Luckily, there were two identical cameras. There was a, a primary that flew and a backup on the ground. And when this aberration was discovered, they were able to rework that backup and it had its own corrective optics in there. So they replaced you know, when wide, wide field planetary camera two went in, um, it had its own optics in it. Now, another interesting thing, I, I talked about the thermal considerations. One thing they didn't get right, the solar arrays, you can see how warped they are here. These are the original arrays. Um, those arrays would, would warp like that and cause vibration every time it passed in and out of in and out of shadow and they couldn't you couldn't observe until the scope stopped shaking so they had to replace the um, the solar arrays and then you'll this is an ongoing story gyroscopes it seems like the it seems like the critical items are always going to be those that spin very quickly the gyroscopes and the reaction wheels and they're they're key to the operation and they are the things that uh, will always seem to break down first. Here's some gratuitous pictures. You see him putting CoStar in. You can see just how big that actually was. Here's the wide field planetary camera two going in. And then a look at what it did. Faint object camera, again, faint objects were what was really affected by the aberration. You can see that here. And then after the fix went in like this. Here's a look at M100 from the wide field planetary camera. And again, this improvement wasn't because of CoStar. Those op that, that correction was actually done inside the camera. The second mission removed the Goddard, uh, the Goddard high resolution spectrograph and the faint image spectrograph. And they put in a new space telescope interest imaging spectrograph and the near infrared camera, NICMOS. Fine guidance sensors again, here you go, reaction wheel assemblies, and then always some mis miscellaneous maintenance. And I always love to have some pictures of astronauts floating around doing a job. I, I, I can't imagine what it's like for these people to, to be working in an environment like that. On that equipment, in that environment, unbelievable. The third mission didn't do any equipment swap outs. This was um, pushed up and it actually split what was going to be done by the third mission into two because three of the six gyroscopes had failed, leaving only three that needed for really fine pointing. And despite what the ESA video said, uh, Hubble can point with one, but its operation is degraded. Its pointing isn't as accurate.
accurate and, and its tracking isn't as accurate on one gyro as it is with the three. So anyhow, all of this was to get, get things up and, and really get the gyroscopes going. Um, and what I find interesting, you know, they've also, they're also going to solid state. <laughs> when it was first launched, they were recording their data on tape uh, and transmitting it down. And uh, so now they, they, they came into the late 20th century and, and got uh, solid state electronics going. And again, just some shots of them working on the Hubble. The last one, or the second half of that mission, changed out some cameras. Faint object camera came out, a new camera, advanced camera for surveys went in. The flexible arrays, they replaced again. Now they went to a, a rigid solar array that actually produced a lot more power as well. There you go, reaction wheels, once again, uh, replaced and then some other things. And this uh, NICMOS, that was an infrared, as, as I said, the near infrared. And it had internal cooling, which uh, had, a, had a lifetime that had expired. So it wasn't cooling anymore. So they came up with a, a new cryo cooler and a radiator that they could install to extend the life of, of the NICMOS instrument. Here you see him pulling out the, the uh, faint object camera give again an idea of the size of these things. Here's a look at, uh, at the NICMOS radiator. So that's helping cool that uh, near infrared sensor. There's the wide field planetary camera here. And the look at the new arrays is from those uh, flexible ones that rolled up like a bank blanket, these ones folded. And then the last mission, um, they got rid of COSTAR and the wide field planetary camera two and uh, put in wide field planetary camera three and uh, cosmic organ spectrograph. They replaced all the gyroscopes, replaced more fine guidance sensors, and they attached a, a mechanism that uh, will allow a spacecraft to dock with Hubble later to deorbit it when it's finally reached the end of its life. So here's that soft capture mechanism. There's a look at the wide field planetary camera three. And you can see the improvement over time. Obviously, you know, problem between one and two was, was the fact of the sphere collaboration. But between two and three, there's even improved resolution just based on improved optics and things inside the camera and improved sensors. And that's what it looks like now. Um, that was after being released. And uh, that's the last time anybody saw it. What does the future hold? Well, it's expected to last through at least 2026. It's feasible that another servicing mission could, um, could go up there and extend the life, but it's really not practicable. Um, I, I just don't, fiscally, um, I don't see it happening. And, um, really everything else. I mean, you know, we're talking the scope is 31 years old now and it's about reaching the end of its life. Again, those gyroscopes are the, are the really the limiting factor. Uh, right now, there's three of them alive, three of them have failed, three of them are alive. And one of the ones that's functional is a little spastic. It, it's a little erratic um, and could fail. As a matter of fact, if, if you heard in the news, I, I believe it was in March, uh, when Hubble went into safe mode, that safe mode was triggered because commands were uploaded to try to uh, make up for this erratic behavior of that one, um, one gyroscope, and then it caused some problems that they didn't, didn't catch in ground testing, but has since been corrected. Another point is, you know, it... it a lot of astronomers are, are really hoping that it stays around so to be able to complement the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, some, some people kind of may believe that James Webb is, is, is a better Hubble, but it's not a Hubble at all. Uh, it, it, it really is primarily an infrared observatory and uh, you know Hubble can complement those ob observations from James Webb. 
So here's uh, some of the highlights of what Hubble has done for science over the years. Age of the universe, using the Cepheid variables as standard candles, um, it was able to, scientists were able to uh, really tighten up the estimate on the age of the, of the universe. Um, you know, it, it had gone from anywhere between 10 to 20 billion years to about 13.7. And uh, the estimates I read on, on the error bars for that estimated age, anywhere from three to 10%. Some people, some things I read said it improved it to with plus or minus 10. Others said plus or minus three. And I don't know if that was initially 10 and has since been um, improved uh, with subsequent observations down to three or, or what. I, I, I didn't find anything to tell me what those, um, why the difference there. It was in, in, instrumental in uh, studying the expansion of the universe and the discovery of, of dark energy. And uh, these supernova search teams, they're using type 1A supernovas and to, to study the, uh, again, the standard candles to study the rate of expansion of the universe. And uh, they found beyond a shadow of a doubt that the universe, the, the rate of expansion is accelerating. And the unknown thing that was causing that, they called dark energy. So there's a couple of examples of what may happen. Um, you know, it, it appears that dark energy is becoming more, um, uh, more powerful, a, a bigger influence over time. And that would be this curve, which leads to the big rip. Current physics under Einstein's model has the universe just kind of slowly expanding, dying out without, without the big rip. And if dark energy were actually getting weaker and gravity more uh, and stronger over time, we leads to the big crunch. So there's just down here's a look at some of the distant galaxies where they're actually picking up these type 1A supernovas that they used uh, in that study. Three of the people in those two groups uh, ended up eventually winning Nobel Prize in physics for, um, for this discovery. A lot of study of supermassive black, black holes. Um, the spectra and the images uh, from Hubble well suited for it. So you look at these pictures and what they're talking about here, they, they were that most of the time when there was colliding galaxies, it led to these, um, the, the black holes actually feeding and emitting jets. So, and you, they were actually able to image the jets. This, I believe are diffraction spikes in this one. But if you look closely here, you can actually see the jets as, as here uh, coming from those central black holes, same thing there. Um, they also, um, we're able to confirm the presence of these black holes by measuring radial velocity of stars around the center. So here you can see this is an image of the center of M87. And the stars on this side, over time, they were receding. They were redshifted. So they were receding. And the stars on this side were moving towards the Earth. So they're, they're blue shifted. And you know, the rates, the, the amount of that shift um, sh was indicative of the speed, the orbital speed of these stars. And uh, it, that speed couldn't be accounted for by the number of stars, the gravitation uh, field of the, the number of stars that were actually present in the center. So the only thing that, even though it couldn't be seen, the only thing that could be causing those velocities was uh, orbiting around a, a supermassive black hole. Hubble imaged the deep field and ultra deep fields. Okay, so these images here was the, the first one was the deep field where, you know, one, one of these sci, uh, astronomers said, hey, you know, let's, let's point Hubble at a, at, a, at a blank spot in space for uh, as long as we can and, and see what we see. And they saw thousands of galaxies. Well, the, the deep field, those galaxies took back to about 1.5 billion years after the formation, after the Big Bang. Then they went to an ultra deep field, even longer. And that got 
observations back to about 800 million years after the Big Bang. So these, these galaxies are as they appeared only 800 million years after, after the Big Bang. Then they went to an infrared, the ultra deep field infrared. And that extended things down to about 480 million years uh, before the big, or just after the Big Bang. That's as far as Hubble can go uh, because anything older than that is redshifted beyond what Hubble can can see. It, 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 its infrared detectors won't pick up uh, the light that's redshifted that far. And that's where James, that's where the James Webb telescope is gonna come in. And James Webb is gonna get us back to about 200 million years after the Big Bang. I was surprised at the amount of planetary science and, and exoplanet science that uh, Hubble has been involved in. Uh, in, this, in these cases, um, a lot of words there, but they're talking about um, how its observations were supporting and refining the theories of, of planet formation. And in this case, it was the differences in the color of the disk of protoplanetary material that's surrounding um, the central star. And you know the the darker disks are flatter and denser, and that means it more easily can form planets. Whereas the lighter disks are not as dense, uh, more diffuse. Also, they discovered an awful lot of uh, things going on. Like, okay, so here we're looking in the Orion Nebula, and unfortunately, with this picture, it's a little small. If you were to see this picture full screen. Um, each one of these is pointing into an area, a star formation area. And what they found was that the young stars um, make it very difficult because of the amount of UV radiation blasting out of the young stars. It's, it's making planet, planetary formation very difficult, this hard time surviving early. Um, so it takes a little while. Hubble was also the first to take an actual visible light picture of an exoplanet. In this case, the central star represented by that dot has actually been blanked out on the light from that star because it's so bright, which allows you then to see the disk of protoplanetary material around, around the side. And right there is Thermal Hawk B. And that was its position here. You see, they, they show it where it was in 2004, 2006. So you've actually seen movement it was the first picture, actual visible light picture of an exoplanet. Doing some studies with atmosphere of exoplanets. Dis discovered um, methane on, on a planet, Jupiter-sized planet, and also water vapor. And one of the most important things about this is the fact that the more capable observatories that are, are planned and upcoming, James Webb being one of them, it kind of it's kind of a proof of concept that those new scopes will actually be able to do a worthwhile study of the atmospheres around um, these protoplanets, or excuse me, these exoplanets, and that's all based on spectra, uh, the spectra, spectra blah, 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 excuse me, spectrographic analysis of the light of the star as it shines through the atmosphere on the limb of the planet. Hubble found four moons of, uh, around Pluto that were unknown at the time. In this image, this black band uh, is much darker because it's a combination of images where Pluto and Charon are so bright that if you image them, you would never be able to see the other, the other uh, four. And it uh, was used extensively to uh, study item or objects in the, in the Kuiper belt. And uh, they found the, the second target for New Horizons after it completed the flyby of Pluto. It, it was uh, ground-based telescopes couldn't find anything for, for New Horizons to get to after Pluto, but uh, Hubble did. There's some non-scientific accomplishments as well. Uh, you know, most of it is, is contributions to aerospace engineering. And it's, it's been a, a marvelous laboratory uh, for studying 
structures and and uh, equipment and things on orbit. Okay, graphite composite in the vacuum. Uh, studying how optics are contaminated by off gassing of things around it and by human servicing, uh, radiation damage and, and uh, behavior of things over a long period of time. Um, you know, one of the things they learned about the gyroscopes and was that uh, they were using pressurized oxygen to develop, to, to push this fluid that suspended the, uh, the gyroscope's wheel. And uh, that was causing the electric wires to corrode. Now, for the life of me, I don't understand why they would have used pressurized oxygen to begin with, because oxygen is so reactive and corrosive. But then, hey, geez, then they switched to nitrogen, and they lasted a little bit longer. Uh, mirrors have lasted much longer than, than what they thought. After 30 plus years, you know, 31 years, there hasn't been any measurable degra degradation in the, uh, in the mirror. And then all the work um, to develop the procedures and the tools, et cetera, for the servicing missions played a big payoff. This, this is a foot restraint that goes on the end of the robotic arm. On the, it was on the on, end of the robotic arm in the shuttle. There's a long story in, in Catherine Sullivan's book, very interesting, about how Bruce McCandless um, worked to develop that and, and what it did for things and how revolutionary it was. And now it, it's, it's standard. Um, you know, tools, the torque wrenches and all this, these things were directly applicable to getting the ISS built and uh, for any later construction in space. There's also been some intangible contributions, you know, in my opinion, really, uh, the biggest thing that, that Hubble has done is, is kind of just fire people up and get them interested when they see beautiful pictures like the pillars of creation here. Uh, you know, it, 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 it gets at least some people fired up and interested in um, science, engineering, um, astronomy. And, and that can't be a bad thing. I mean, especially the way science kind of is viewed nowadays, you know, you get people interested in it and, and thinking about it and understanding what it's really all about. Can't beat it. So that's all I've got. Uh, sorry for all the words and not, not a lot of pretty pictures, but it's, it's the old engineer in me that uh, <laughs> did things for, for uh, critical design reviews and et cetera, where you had to have a lot of words and pictures didn't really matter so much. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have a... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, say, uh, my name is Vic Barton. I'm one of the, uh, I'm a member of the Astronomy Club. And you may have already said it, but I missed it. What, uh, you know, here on terrestrial telescopes, when you're taking photos, you uh, usually go with a, a German equatorial mount. You use... Uh, um, you know, right ascension and declination, and you go on the North Star, and etc. Well, you, you know, that's orbiting the Earth at seventeen thousand five hundred miles per hour, and it's and it's. Uh, what are they? Are they using um, uh, RA and uh, declination, or what do you use? I I am not hundred percent sure. Um, that would be, you know, the, the, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute would, would have that answer for sure. But I believe that it is, uh, you know, right ascension and declination, uh, as it would be, uh, for somebody on earth. Um, but the beauty of it is, you know, that Hubble can go in, in three dimensions, not a problem. So, you know, there's, you don't have to worry about polar alignment and, and things of that nature. And, and, and when you're pointing, you just, but I, I believe um, because they, you know, they, they do have to obviously use a coordinate system. That's mm -hmm. a good question that I, I'm not positive of the answer on. Okay, thanks. Hi, Gordon, this is Nancy. Yeah. Um, I'm curious as to uh, why the name Hubble was chosen. I see Mr. Spitzer there was one of the people having the ideas. Why was it named after Hubble? Well, mainly because, as I understand it, um, you know, he was he was kind of the 
discoverer of the expanding universe. And, and that uh, those little fuzzy blobs out there were actually galaxies and not nebula. And one of the primary objectives of Hubble was to measure the age and um, the expansion of the universe. Logical. Thank you. Gordon, this is Brian Cashin. Um, when you were talking about the cone of avoidance, the 50 degree cone of avoidance that Hubble could not look at because of the sun, is that more related to uh, the potential for a negative heat impacts from the sun or, or just, or actually just light on the sun or both? That it would be, um, it would have to be both because, you know, you, you're inside, you, you think, you think of the heat. I mean, you know, the inside of that OTA is, is, is black, 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 which is going to, if, if it's exposed to the sunlight, it, it's going to be heating up. So you're stressing the structures with heat and you're also um, starting to get very bright, very bright light that may um, saturate and even damage um, the detectors. Thanks. Gordon, can you um, uh, explain again a little bit about this? I think it was called the South Atlantic Anomaly. That's the first time I've heard of that. I'm curious about it. So the way the magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field goes, and I'm, I, I, I can't explain exactly why this is the case, Nancy, but in, in this area over, over South Atlantic and South America, is the, the, our magnetic field is, it, is at its weakest. Hmm. And that allows then, you know, where the, um, most of the time, the radiation, the particles of radiation are, are being directed around the, uh, the magnetic, the lines of the magnetic field. And they're further out. Here, it allows uh, a higher dose of radiation closer to the Earth's surface. And it is, it's, it's very, I mean, again, I'll talk to the, the program I was on. We, we had numerous, we had to continue to observe because we're a weather set, you know, so we, we didn't curtail observations there. But, you know, once, maybe twice a month, we would, we would trip and go into a safe mode flying through there just because of the radiation, the increased radiation. And again, it's, it's due to the fact that in that area, the Earth's magnetic field is at its weakest and therefore shields us the, the least. Hmm. Thank you. That's my definite learn something new every day, that one right there. And that's, that's something that's very, I mean, you know, the, the ISS folks think about that quite a bit because they increase their radiation exposure every orbit when they go through there. Hmm. Hey, Gordon, uh, this is uh, Robert Foster. I, I wrote a little question in here. I just, I, I figure this must happen, but I wonder how much of a problem it is. Uh, you know, the Hubble's making an orbit every 90 minutes, I think you said, but if it's observing something that any given time, do, does the Earth get in the way of that path of view? And how often does that happen? And what do you do to mitigate it? <clears throat> well, it, it depends. It depends on obviously where that target is in relation to the Earth. So, if, if we were to look at if we were to look at this, and and say we're we're imaging, we're we're worried about this this star here. Okay, so you're going to be able to you're going to be able to see that, and we'll forget that the sun is there, so we don't have an avoidance solar avoidance angle to worry about. You're going to be able to see this target from the time Hubble gets about here on its orbit until the time it back around to about here on its orbit, and then there's going to be a certain section where it's obscured by the by the Earth, but 
if it's something that's outside of the plane of the orbit, above or below, sure. you might be able to see it almost all the time. And right. that's where, you know, I, I kind of jokingly said that I, I can't imagine the work that goes into scheduling the actual observations, how it's pointed, where it's pointed, for how long it's pointed by those folks in, in Baltimore, because they have to take all that into account. They have to know when that is going to going to be visible. And, you know, you, you think about it. OK, so again, we'll say you're interested in this galaxy, but you want to the, the 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 deep field. You may not be able to you may want hours of observations in this galaxy, but you can only get maybe, you know, 45 minutes in an orbit. So they have to they have to go to that pool of approved uh, proposals and and see what could fit in. When I can't look at that, what can I see that people want to look at? And you know, it, it, it's it's got to be an incredible. I, I just can't imagine, and and I can't imagine what that what happens in that place like in March, when all of a sudden Hubble goes into safe mode. And you've got a principal investigator who's who's put years of work <laughs> into, and his his program is is running, and all of a sudden Hubble's, but you know, ah, oh, crazy, a lot of work. Hmm. Well, I guess a follow up does does is Hubble always in the same orbit, or can the orbit be modified uh, to get better viewing uh, angles? No. Yeah, no, it's 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 in that it's in its orbit. I mean, the orbit it was released in is the is the orbit that it's in. the The shuttle may have been able to change. Well, even then, because it was because the shuttle was up at its top of its limit, it probably couldn't do much of a change of orbit when it when it had it grappled. But because there's no propellant on board, as as I said, everything. All the pointing is done by reaction wheels and differential torque of those reaction wheels. So there's no way to get out of that 23 and a half degree orbital plane. It's, it's stuck there for, you know, until, the only difference is atmospheric, you know, the, the drag will eventually bring it down. So height is the only, is the only change. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks very much. If anybody else has any questions for Gordon, just unmute and um, and, a and ask them. Say, so Gordon, uh, Art Trevina here. I had a question about the docking adapter you mentioned for when uh, the Hubble HST reaches its uh, end of life. Uh, does NASA have a specific satellite in mind for uh, docking with the HST and bringing it down to a controlled uh, in a controlled way no there's 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 no plans for any kind well nothing at firm right now for any kind of tug yeah. or anything that, that can you know but what they've got they've got a standard now they've got that standard grapple feature so um they know what they need to do now there's a lot of work going on in this field right now and northrop grumman is doing an awful lot where there are actually going up and and grabbing um comsats and geo stationary orbit and extending the life they're actually docking and these these are satellites that aren't made for servicing they're 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 grabbing mm -hmm. onto the 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 old liquid propulsion engines so you know when it comes time i don't think it it would be terribly long it's not like it would have to be a a, a huge developmental effort but uh you know i i it <laughs> they, they put it on there but there's nothing to nothing to right. bring it down yet Thank you. Uh, this is Terry Hancock here from Grand Mesa Observatory. I just wanted to thank you, uh, Gordon, for uh, the great presentation. And, um, you know, it really was, was great. And it, it's really amazing what the Hubble Telescope has done for the astronomy community um since um since it was launched uh i'm in touch with a lot of guys that do astrophotography and uh you know you mentioned earlier about people you know grabbing the data and doing their own processing 
Uh, I've never done any, but I've, I've had students and uh, contacts that have done quite a lot. And, you know, we, we owe the Hubble telescope for things like um, introducing the Hubble palette, which is one of my favourite things when it comes to doing astrophotography, photographing in narrowband. I think the Hubble telescope uh, actually introduced that and it's become very, very popular uh, amongst um, amateur astrophotographers. So, that's so, a specific, yeah. specific enhancement curves and things? Hubble palette, which is photographing uh, in um, narrowband filters, the most popular type that amateurs are using is um, hydrogen alpha, uh, uh, oxygen and, and sulfur, and combining those to create a, um, a false colour image, which is a bit like uh, the pillars of creation. I think that was done in Hubble Ballot, um, possibly not with using exact same filters, but, but very similar, I believe. And a lot of my images, probably 80, 90 percent of my images are uh, all done in using uh, double palette technique for the processing. So yeah, it's become very, very popular among amateurs. So the all thanks to the Hubble telescope. Anybody else have any questions for Gordon? Well, I certainly, I certainly joined Terry in, in um, yeah, commending your presentation, the, uh, the visuals. And I, I, I definitely can see the engineer in you there, Gordon, with the detail, but the, uh, the, the visuals on the presentation, it's just very, very nicely done and very well presented and lots of great information. Yeah, I, I've seen a lot of stuff about Hubble, but this, this is just a very comprehensive and nice presentation. So thank you very much. I could, I could have shown an awful lot of pictures, but you know, <laughs> you see the pictures all the time. And, and I, I really got drawn into the, into the story of uh, how it got to be what it was and what it takes to keep it up there. Yeah, so, so thank you. And um, I think that uh, unless anybody has any more questions for Gordon, I don't think we'll, since we have a joint meeting going on, I don't think we'll delve too much into any club, specific club business. Joel, I just wanted to ask you if you had any other additional comments as well from your end. Um, yeah, Nancy, I would like to really thank Gordon. I thought that was a very superb presentation. Uh, you would, anyone, Anyone turning, uh, joining in would have thought he must have worked on this thing because <laughs> he seems like he really at least understands a lot of the mechanisms and concepts behind it. The one question I have for Gordon is, um, I don't recall you mentioned the orbital, uh, the orbital height. Do you know what that is? Yeah, what approximately uh, 340 nautical miles. But obviously that varies and it'll, it'll be lowering as atmosphere, as, as drag over time brings it down. So what was the reason why they picked that as its orbit? That was, it was as high as the shuttle could get it and still have a sufficient reserve that the astronauts would agree to fly because they didn't want to, they didn't want to get it. I mean, people wanted to get it as high as they could. And in another point, is is that low at a lower orbit it becomes harder to point again there's you don't think that drag is that much of a, of a factor but with the big um solar panels and things just torquing that thing around it it, it gets harder the lower it gets so it was a big trade-off joel between uh getting it as high as they could and making it safe so that if there was a problem on the shuttle they had enough fuel for uh, emergency deorbit the James Webb telescope will be a million miles from Earth at a Lagrange point. So there will be no maintenance on the James Webb. That's kind of scary. Gordon, this is Douglas Grote. 
I want to thank you for something. Uh, that is the audio quality you have. I've had trouble hearing some of the presentations before, and this audio quality was excellent. And I thank you for that. Okay, does anybody have any other comments or questions about either the program or club business for either, for any of the three clubs involved here? Anybody have any questions or comments about general club stuff? Uh, Nancy, this is Joel. I'd just like to thank you for uh, inviting us. And um, when uh, we get back to live meetings and such, I, I hope that our connection with your group uh, does not end at that point. So we'll have to, uh, you know, see if we can make some sort of uh, uh, an occasional remote gathering, I think. I, I, think, I think I agree. And I, I specifically remember one time before the pandemic, um, Douglas and I tried to um, Skype into one of your awesome presentations that was going back east. And we had a really difficult time. So now life is much easier and we can all participate in everybody else's um, programs and stuff. So I agree that we're not gonna let that connection go now that we have it. And let's just keep sharing. And uh, that's it for me uh, in terms of uh, comments. So thank you very much. Okay, Art, Art or Brian, do you guys have anything from the BCAS side you wanna talk about? Just wanted to thank Gordon for an excellent presentation. I, I learned a bunch. It was great, appreciate it. Yeah, ditto for me. Thank you, Gordon. Uh, and thanks, Nancy, uh, for hosting this all along. It went very, very smoothly. I think I think we're getting the hang of the Zoom thing, right? <laughs> Finally. <laughs> All right. Well, then, if that's if nobody else has any comments, then I want to thank everybody for participating and joining in and um, asking great questions. And we all again thank Gordon very much for his awesome presentation. So thanks, everybody. And I, I'll leave. Um, I'll end the meeting. But thanks to everybody and stay safe. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night.